Hi, everybody. You might have just got the last of the bells, the four um, gongs. Uh, welcome back, everybody. This is so exciting for me to be able to share my 25,000 word dissertation on uh, my husband's great grandmother, Alberta Sturgis, the ninth Countess of Sandwich. And I did this live a couple of days ago. If you haven't watched the first one, uh, and you're interested in American heiresses, and of course, at, during the Gilded Age, uh, this is for you. So I have wonderful comments coming through. Thank you so, so much for all of your comments. And what I've decided to do with doing these lives, which I plan on doing two to three times a week, and probably over the next year or so, because my dissertation isn't due for a while because I'm doing mine part-time, very, very part-time, but it's really wonderful to have you all along with me because it very much uh, motivates me. So it, it very much motivates me to continue on with this journey. Like I said, there are so many documents, it's almost mind-blowing. And you can see here spread out on the dining room table, I've just only started to delve into two boxes. Uh, this is my next box up here. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. Also, throughout these lives, you will have access to the renovation of the Munimit Room. Those of you who are new, the Munimit Room is really considered the archive room in, uh, in historical buildings like Mapperton. So Mapperton is Elizabethan, it's Tudor Jacobean. And it has, of course, a Munimit Room where it would hold family archives. Our Munimit Room, if you watched that episode uh, that I gave you the link beforehand on the, on the first live stream of Alberta, it is in quite serious need of repair. So thank you all so much for joining me. We're gonna be on here for about an hour together, so you can always come off and come back on, but it's just amazing, again, to have all of you here with me and, of course, all over the world. We've got England here. We have lots of people from America. Do just put in the comments uh, where you are from. Also, what I do want to say is I have, uh, because I go around the United Kingdom visiting incredible historical houses, and as many of you know, I also report and commentate on the royal family. They've kept me very busy this past year. And I'm able, when I visit these historic houses or these places, to pick up sort of mementos. And so I want to be able to gift some of those to you. And after this, uh, at the very end of this stream, I'm just gonna sort of look at my screen and pick somebody here who just turns up from the live chat and then I will contact you and you will be receiving from me uh, just to say how much I appreciate all of you joining, but I can only pick sort of one. Um, this was when I went to Plymouth in Cornwall. I visited Pentilly Castle. So if you haven't seen that episode yet, it's on American Viscountess playlist season one. And I was able to visit Plymouth. And of course that's where the Mayflower set off and you will be receiving a Mayflower uh, for its 400 uh, anniversary, 1620 to 2020, a Mayflower coaster, a Mayflower uh, button, um, badge, a uh, uh, Plymouth magnet, the passenger list of the Mayflower in 1620. You will also be receiving uh, Mayflower, a brief history of the pilgrims and the Mayflower. And actually, uh, this is mine, but I don't think you, oh no, you will, yeah. And then the Mayflower story. So this is just a little brochure of the Mayflower Museum that I was able to visit. And you can also see that on that episode. So I will be picking that at the end and then sending this to you wherever you are around the world. So every time we meet for a live, I want to be able to give something back to you. Uh, thank you all for such amazing, kind comments. I really, really appreciate it and love it that you're all joining me live. So as you remember, just a little bit of a recap. When we first met live a few days ago, that's Alberta, uh, the beginning, if you like, I was able to dive into some of her family history on the Chicago side, in particular, Kate Buckingham, Buckingham Fountain, and obviously the real loss that she felt 
from losing her father when she was aged 17. Now, I have discovered a lot more. I sat here this morning with my father-in-law, the 11th Earl of Sandwich, and he's very thrilled that I am doing this project because for him, he will uh, hopes to find out a little bit more about his grandmother, uh, Alberta Sturgis. That was his grandmother. And she died when he was only eight years old. So my father-in-law was born in 1943 and Alberta died in 1951. And I asked him this morning, some of his recollections around Alberta. And he said, every time we came to visit, she always had a present in a secret drawer for us. So it's a lovely, uh, I think, memory that he's had even at the age of eight before she passed away of his grandmother. So he's very interested in learning about this as well. And you can see from the title, we are gonna be talking about today, Royal Connections. It's not necessarily going to go into my dissertation, so what we'll be discussing during these lives and when you watch it later, not all of it will be going into my dissertation. Remember, dissertation is sort of uncovering and answering a question, uh, and but uh, there are things I will be discussing today around my dissertation. One of them was revealed to me in the wee hours of last night, no, the night before, it wasn't New Year's Eve, the night before, and it brought me to tears and I had my father-in-law come over this morning and we read it together and I'm going to get quite emotional about it because I think I'm going to be able to explain to all of you why this letter that I found in this pack of letters here, I had gone through each of these letters and had to go through them twice because I'm just getting used to the writing. And I am actually getting used to the writing. I feel really proud that over the past three days, I've made such progress in reading Alberta's writing. I'm so, so pleased. But when I went through them once, I didn't necessarily find anything. And I'll tell you what I was looking for. But I thought, just go through them again, Julie. Just go through them again. So I did, and I found a letter. And it sort of, in one sense made the start of this year even more special. Sorry, I'm getting emotional, but I am going to uh, read that to you later because it's really quite incredible what I discovered. Thank you again for all of your uh, comments right here. It's so wonderful. And when you are watching this back, if you can't make it live, I do keep the chat on so you can see the chat on the right hand side as well. So you can just see what other uh, lovely uh, participants here um, who are joining in. And again, keep chatting amongst yourself. I think it's fantastic we have this group and it, we will be together hopefully uh, two to three times a week as I do these live sessions. So before we get into uh, hoping, yes, uh, some of you have asked about the streaming. So uh, here I am at Mapperton. Mapperton, as many of you know, is our historic house and we are in the middle of nowhere. If you were to drop a pin in the most remote part of Southwest England, you would land on us. And it's beautiful and it's amazing and we're surrounded by hills and, and uh, valleys and it's fantastic, but it does mean that really good Wi-Fi hasn't reached us yet. So part one was 720p uh, and this one, we've gone for it today and we've done 1080p. So hopefully you will be able to see what I'm showing a little bit better. So I will reshow some of the photos uh, later on in this session that I think many of you weren't able to see. I do have my phone here and I can zoom in and out as well. And also the chats that's happening right now, I do go back and look through the chats, uh, all of them as well. So. I will be reading all of your chats um, because I go back through them and a lot of you have given so much great advice on where I can uh, look for things about Alberta and so on and so on. So thank you all for joining. So I thought I would start since this is the year, it is January 1st. So happy, happy new year, everybody. Happy new year. Welcome to 2023. And this is the year of the coronation of King Charles III. Uh, 
I will be commentating on that, uh, and so I'm excited about that. But I thought I would start, since it is January 1st, it's the year of the coronation. We haven't had a coronation uh, since 1953, so many of us have never even experienced um, a coronation before. And what I did find in one of the boxes was uh, what's called a packet of thanks on behalf of various members of royal family for condolences between 1925 and 1959. There's not that many, but I will uh, read them to you and give you close-ups of the seal on the top. So this one is the earliest one, and this is December 1925. And it's from St. James's Palace. So I'm just going to zoom in here just a little bit here. It's from St. James's Palace. And obviously, not obviously, but at that time, Alberta and George Montagu, they were at that time in 1925, the ninth Earl and Countess of Sandwich. So it looks like George and Alberta wrote uh, to the king. Um, and... Uh, and um, uh, and this is what their reply was. I have received the king's commands to thank you on his majesty's behalf, as well as on behalf of his majesty's sisters, for the beautiful flowers you kindly sent as a tribute of affection and respect to the memory of her late majesty, Queen Alexandra, by which the king is deeply touched." And then it is signed Lord Chamberlain, and this is December 1925. So this was uh, about the death of Queen Alexandra, and we're going to get into that. So the death of Queen Alexandra, who was married to King Edward VII. Now, we do know from photos here that uh, George and Alberta uh, did uh, entertain with King Edward VII and Queen Alexandra, and this is also how we know it. So hopefully you can see maybe a little bit of the close-up there. There we go. I think that's actually pretty good if everybody can see that. And you can see the seal above is St. James's Palace. So I think that's pretty spectacular. I think that's as close as I can probably get. There we go. Now, what's very interesting about that is in my wee hours of the night, going through these letters twice, because I think it's really important to go through them because I, again, I'm getting used to reading Alberta's writing and some of it's quite difficult. And I found this. So this will relate very much to uh, Queen Alexandra. So George and Alberta's firstborn son was my husband's grandfather. So my father-in-law, John, the 11th Earl of Sandwich, his father was named Alexander Victor Edward Paulet Montague. And he was christened June 14th. But it looks like Alberta, because this is her writing, was in Massachusetts, called Swampscott, Massachusetts, at a place called New Ocean House. And she was clearly just writing notes, possibly to herself. So she wrote a note to herself on July 2nd, 1906. I know that my husband's grandfather was born in May of 1906. Therefore, his christening was June 14th, and it's written. Uh, Alexander Victor Edward Paulet Montague by Bishop of uh, Stephanie, the christening of Mrs. George Montague's baby, uh, uh, and then it says at, um, looks like at Faith, we think it says Faith's Chapel inside of Westminster Abbey. My father-in-law and I were unsure of Faith's Chapel. Um, on, uh, uh, in the presence of his godparents. So here were uh, my husband's grandfather's godparents. It says Lady Agnetta Montague who represented the queen as godmother. And I do know that my husband's uh, grandfather, who was being christened here, his godmother was Queen Alexandra. And here we can see a note um, uh, of thanks back from His Majesty Edward VII. 
thanking George and Alberta for the beautiful flowers for her death. So I thought that was very, very interesting. The, his other godparents were uh, Lady Grosvenor and Lord Montague of Bewley as well, and a couple more, but those are the ones that probably I, I, I know most of. Lord Montague of Bewley, uh, if you haven't been to the National Motor Museum or watched those episodes this year, I filmed with our cousin Rafe Montague, and it looks like his uh, great-grandfather, is that right? So his, sorry, his, uh, Rafe's grandfather was godfather to my husband's grandfather. There you go. Phew. But if you want to watch Bewley episodes, they are on American Vi my playlist, American Viscountess season two. So I thought that was very interesting. I'm just going to stick this back. And again, I thought I would read uh, a couple more of these um, of these from the royal family itself. And the one I wanted to get to, which I really, of course, uh, liked, was this one. And I'm going to go a little bit closer so you can see. And it's Buckingham Palace. So the letterhead is Buckingham Palace. And again, I'm going to go closer just so you can see that seal right there. Hopefully it's clear enough, Buckingham Palace, or at least enough that you can see. I mean, I know it's quite difficult. Maybe I can get even a little bit closer, everybody. There we go. I think that's a little bit better. If I go close up there, you can see Buckingham Palace now. This was written to, again, George Montague, Lord Sandwich. It doesn't have a date on it. It just says February 16th. So I'm unsure of, so I sh sorry, it doesn't have a year on it. It has February 16th. I'm unsure of the year. Uh, again, thank you all so much for your comments. They're brilliant. I see them coming through. So this says, Dear Lord Sandwich, Her Majesty, Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, has asked me to write and thank you for your letter. Her Majesty feels that you can understand because you have known the same sorrow and suffering. That's right. I know when this was. My father and I looked at this today. So this was on the death of George the uh, sixth. That's correct. And the reason uh, a lady in waiting was writing this and the reason that um, uh, Her Majesty feels that you can understand because you have known the same sorrow and suffering is because at the time uh, Alberta had died. So if we remember uh, exactly um, that uh, Alberta died in 1951 and King George VI died in 1952 and therefore we had Queen Elizabeth's coronation, uh, Queen Elizabeth II's coronation in 19. 53. It's very hard to remember all these dates, but I think I've done it there. So this was obviously for the death of uh, Queen Elizabeth II's father. So I'll start again. It says, Her Majesty uh, Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, has asked me to write a thank you for your letter. Her Majesty feels that you can understand because you have known the same sorrow and suffering, and she has been so much touched by your letter. I was so glad that it was I who was asked to write to you, as I remember so well the days long ago when you were both so kind to me and my brother, and I remember that... Uh, I remember what a delightful and wonderful person Lady Sandwich, that's Alberta, was and realize that her loss must be hard and her uh, hard for you and her family. Our, that's a hard word. I'm, I'm getting my head around it. Um, um, let's see if I can put it together. Um, oh, our hearts... Uh, our hearts, and this is again a bit tricky, it's hard, our hearts, um, uh, how because there is so little, so I think it's our hearts hurt, 
now. That's it. Thank you. Takes me a little bit. Our hearts hurt now because there is so little anyone can do for Her Majesty. Uh, uh, for Her Majesty. And then it says that the great tide of sympathy is a real support and comfort to her. And then it signed your, uh, it signed Dorothy Halifax, Lady in Waiting. Woo! Um, so that is pretty special. This one I think is for me very, very special. I, again, I won't read all of them, uh, but we have one from Sandringham and I just like to show you the seals. I think they're just beautiful. So we have one from Sandringham and again, this was to George and to Alberta. And this was in 1929. And this would have been George, uh, George V and Queen Mary. So because it says, my dear George, the king wishes me to express his grateful thanks for your kind letter, which his majesty and the queen much appreciated. So we know that at that period, it was King George V and Queen Mary. And it says, the Sandringham heir seems to be doing the king good. And with rest and quiet down here, I'm sure he will go on from strength to strength. His majesty is now able to do breathing and physical exercises, which are most helpful. So obviously he wasn't feeling well, and um, pretty incredible to receive that as well. And what we have here is, uh, this one is from, this one we're not sure of the, this is from Balmoral Castle. This is again, 1954, and it's from somebody named Catherine Seymour. So if anybody, my father and I, we weren't sure about this this morning. It's from Catherine Seymour, but clearly she was at Balmoral Castle and she just writes saying, it was dear Lord Sandwich, it was so kind of you to write me a letter of sympathy when my mother died. So Catherine Seymour's mother died and George and had written a letter and Catherine was obviously at, uh, was at Balmoral Castle. So I thought that was fantastic. We also have a telegram here, and this was in 1942. And it says, so Alberta was still alive, and it's from Queen Mary. So it's signed Mary R. I'll give you a close-up of that. And it just says, Earl of Sandwich, Hinchingbrook House, heartfelt thanks to you both for your sympathy. Signed Mary R. So love that one. Whoops, sorry. Let me just get it into light, everybody. So you hopefully can see that. Really, really brilliant. So these are the packs of letters that have just have a real royal uh, connection here. And I think it's pretty fascinating. So I'm just going to put these back and we're very, very careful with them. I know many of you have said gloves, da da da, but again, the advice I've been given is that as long as your hands are clean, uh, mine are. I wash my hands every time uh, before I come in here and I wash my hands with all natural uh, products and make sure. So yeah, somebody says, hopefully you can publish a book. Well, guess what, everybody? I have a feeling that's going to be coming. Um, so stay tuned on that. But first, let's get done with my dissertation. So I'm just going to put this to one side. Now, Thank you again for uh, joining. You all are amazing. It's incredible that this is my second time that I am uh, doing this and I have almost 200 of you online. And I've, many of you have said great job on reading the books, because their letters, because they are difficult. And I remember uh, somebody once telling me that the more that you read them, the more you'll be able to understand uh, the, of course, the words and the sort of the script of the letters. And that absolutely has, I, I feel I'm really, really getting uh, an understanding of Alberta's writing. So I want to go to Alberta right now. And this is really the moment that I've been waiting to share with you all. It fills me with great joy. But before I share this beautiful letter, which I have put in my notebook here. 
and uh, transcribed and is, it's right here. It's fascinating. And again, I went through this entire stash, stash twice. And I'm gonna explain to you why, what I'm looking for first of all, and then I'm going to explain to you what happened to the family home. So first and foremost, earlier this year, I was able to film with my father-in-law, the 11th Earl of Sandwich, and those episodes are under my playlist on my YouTube channel called American Viscountess Season 2. Do check them out. One of them is called How We Lost Our Family Castle. And it is up in Cambridgeshire. It's called Hinchingbrook House. That is why uh, my titled name is Viscountess Hinchingbrook. And if you watch that episode, I'm not going to give you too much, too much away, but do watch that episode and it will make a lot more sense. But Hinchingbrook House was bought by the Montague family in 1627. They bought the house from the Cromwells. And that is where uh, the first Earl of Sandwich uh, grew up. And he played with Oliver Cromwell in basically the huge garden there. Uh, when they were growing up, they were actually friends. And it had been, that house had been in the family up until 1955. So Alberta Sturgis, the ninth Countess of Sandwich, was the last Countess of Sandwich to live there. So everybody from the first Countess of Sandwich, which is Jemima Crew, uh, who was married to Edward Montague. Edward Montague was given the peerage because he brought Charles II back from exile uh, during what's called the Restoration. And Alberta also lived there as well up until her death in 1951. Unfortunately, four years later, her eldest son, and that's the christening I was just talking about right there, uh, felt he needed to sell it. Please remember that after the Second World War, many of these houses, including Hinchingbrook, which we are going to talk about today, was uh, requisitioned for both the First World War and the Second World War. And... Um, and so many of these houses, when the homeowners came back, it was too much of a financial burden for them to restore and repair them. Taxes came in heavily, heavily, uh, especially after the Second World War, the labor government in particular uh, taxed uh, heavily those with big properties and land. And so it remained economically too difficult for my husband's grandfather to carry on with such a large house. It is a castle. And it's been, I think, you can imagine having a house that's been in the family, you know, since 1627, really difficult to, in one sense, take on that, uh, that, that sadness that the house had been sold. And uh, my husband's grandfather bought uh, Mapperton, so he bought Mapperton, and there was, which is where I am right now, which is a beautiful, as I said, Elizabethan Jacobean Tudor home. It's a manor house. It's in the most beautiful part, I believe, of England. Uh, and the reason that he bought here is because there was adjoining land. So when people ask us how did we end up down here, there actually was adjoining land. So the adjoining land, there was a hunting lodge, and that was built by. Mm, don't quote me on this, but I believe it was built by the seventh Earl of Sandwich and there was a hunting lodge. And so the family would come down, the eighth Earl of Sandwich, uh, Alberta and George uh, came down, not very often, but they would come down. And, and so I think it's, there's a, in some sense, when we talk about Hinchingbrook and you can watch uh, the episodes, I do get very emotional about it. It's where my father-in-law grew up. That's where he spent his childhood, his Hinchingbrook. And of course, the sale happened when he was only, you know, they, they, they left the home when he was only you know, 12 years old, so a small boy. And oh, thank you so much. Someone is saying the Hinchingbrook episodes were bittersweet. They were, uh, I do get emotional when I talk about Hinchingbrook also because it is, you know, I, I, have that name attached to me. And so anytime I can find out more about it, I do. But this is the letter, everybody. And I might get a bit emotional as I read it. Uh, and what caught my eye was at this time when this was written, there is no year on it, but it is October 12th. 
It's from Alberta. She is writing to her brother, her her uh, uh, full brother, biological brother, so with the same father, William, who died when she was 17, and her mother, Betty McLeod, McLeod from uh, Clan McLeod in the Isle of Skye. And Hollister is her brother, and we're going to come around to the name Hollister, but Hollister comes from, Hollister, California was named after uh, the chap that um, in one sense borrowed money from William Sturgis, Alberta's father. He, bar he borrowed money. He was a friend of Alberta's father. His name was uh, Hollister. They were friends. And William Sturgis, I'll read those letters a little bit later, bar let him borrow money. He lost it all to buy sheep in California. He went back borrowed some more and he made good of it and he uh, was a, he sent sort of compounding uh, money from the money he had borrowed and from that William and uh, Betty decided to name their firstborn son after Hollister and Hollister California was named after him he was a great sheep farmer FYI um, we are going to talk about that a little bit more I have all those letters there verifying that story uh, and in fact, we might do that today if we have time. So, but this would have been early on in their marriage, very, very early on in their marriage. They were not the Earl and Countess of Sandwich yet. That happened in 1916 on the death of uh, George's uncle. And he was called in this letter, Uncle Hinch. So after Hinchingbrook, so they call him Uncle Hinch. So Alberta's recently married. She's writing a letter to her brother, and they have come down for the first time to really the hunting lodge. So she's never seen this area of England before. And she writes to her brother. She starts out by saying, and I'm just going to show you the handwriting first so you can see how difficult. It took me a while. Let's see. Let me just turn it. There we go. It took me a while. It took me about probably a good 20 minutes to get through the front back, front back of this letter, but I am unbelievably pleased I did it. So sorry if I get in advance, if I get a bit emotional. So she just starts out by saying, my, my beloved brother, at last a glorious sunny day. <laughs> the second in two weeks. I understand that, obviously it's England. Uh, second in two weeks has gladdened us all and warmed, warmed us into life. And she just says, the men, uh, George, and it looks like Alfred and Colonel uh, Papillon um, have gone uh, shooting. They have gone shooting. So Alberta uh, is not with them right now as she writes this. Uncle Hinch has uh, grown up uh, his place, um, and, uh, asked and, and sorry, ha has given up his place shooting. Sorry. I do have more of it. So uncle Hinch, which who is the eight, at this time, the eighth Earl of Sandwich has given up his place shooting and motored me to Weymouth 21 miles from here. So we are very close to Weymouth, uh, in Dorset and she writes, so now she's in Dorset Land, which is the county where Hinchingbrook is, and she's at the hunting lodge, which is called, uh, which is called Hook Court. And she says, it is such a heavenly country, very hilly, high hedges that almost touch, uh, touch, one, oh, touch overhead. She says, and I'm reading both here, blackberries, and the most lovely thatched villages. I think if George ever came into this, meaning if he were to inherit it, which he did, uh, not Mapperton, but the uh, shooting lodge, uh, he would want to live here a good deal. The farmers are in splendid condition. And then she says this, and this is where it gets very emotional of me. It says, um... I met yesterday neighbors at Mapperton Court. So this, we call it Mapperton House. It used to be called Mapperton Court. About, a, well, she says four miles from here, but it's only just about a mile from here. And then she writes, 
Never in all my life have I seen a small Elizabethan home so beautiful. And I just, you know, so maybe there's a reason that we're here. I just think it's wonderful. And then she says, it belongs to Henry Compton, uh, uh, but uh, at son-in-law of Lady, and that one I couldn't exactly get, uh, not Broughton, but son-in-law. But so Henry's here, um, uh, but uh, here, but it is let to, but it's so let out. So it's been rented out to a cousin who adores Uncle H. But then she writes, but keeps the place too dirty. How I wish you could see it. So again, she's talking about this house. She says, it could be rented for about 150 pounds a year. Uh, and it could be rented for some gentle soul who would make it lovely. And then she must have gone inside and she writes, all oak and wood paneling. Uh, we've got tapestry over the wood paneling here, but many of you who have seen tours of, uh, of Mapperton, all, all, all old oak and wood paneling, diamond panes, creepers uh, outlining every window, clematis, lavender, honeysuckle. And then she just ends it, uh, so I must part off um, more later, Alberta. And that, for me, I think, for me personally, we should put that quote on the Mapperton website, for me personally, with the heartache of having had the family ancestral home sold after having been in the family for 350 years, sold, when you read that from Alberta, who laid her eyes, happened to lay her eyes on, on Mapperton Court and said what a heavenly place it is and never had she ever seen uh, an Elizabethan house so beautiful and talking about the hedgerows and the hills and the clematis and the lavender and the creepers coming out of the windows and the honeysuckle, the blackberries. And I think it's wonderful. And, and it, the difference between Dorset and let's say Cambridgeshire is, is some of that. It's very, very, uh, uh, the landscape here is completely different. It, it's very hilly and there's, you know, valleys and it's rather beautiful down here. So that is uh, the letter and it might come in my dissertation as to sort of a conclusion uh, obviously Hinching Brook because my master's is in country house studies. So I will be weaving in Hinching Brook, absolutely. But this might be a part of my conclusion as, you know, there's a reason that we're here because, you know, according to Alberta, we're in the most beautiful Elizabethan house. And I think that's pretty wonderful. Sorry, I get super emotional about this. So that's going to head to this side. I'd also like to share with you, uh, share with you, and we have so many people live, which is incredible. And somebody has commented that, yes, the, uh, the quality is better. We are at 1080p. I did 780p when I first live streamed because, again, the internet here, we're in the middle of nowhere, which is beautiful, but it's not great. But my husband's here today and he said, go 1080p, it should work. And I'm so happy, everybody. So what I want to read here, which is really also very exciting, this is a typed up letter. So remember at the turn of the century, typewriters became very cool. And so some of the letters, thankfully, are typed. I mean, when I say some, far and few between, but I do pull them out first because I'm always like, oh, gosh, I can read something without having to spend a half hour. So what's really great about this typed letter is this, uh, the eighth Earl of Sandwich died in 1916. And Alberta wrote this letter to her mother from Hinchingbrook. I'll show you the date, uh, January 29th, 1918. So she's really in her sort of first year and a half, if you like, of being the ninth Countess of Sandwich and living at Hinchingbrook because prior to Uncle Hinch's death, she wasn't living at Hinchingbrook. And she and George weren't, they were living in another Montague house. And so she's now at Hinchingbrook and get this. And again, this is, you know, just around sort of uh, uh, towards the end of the First World War. 
And she writes, Darling Mother, how beloved of you to take my house in London. It's such a help, and I can't tell you how I bless you for it. George, too, is so touched and so grateful. It is just like you to think where the burden can be eased. Hinch, so Hinch is Luke's grandfather. Do you remember earlier I talked about uh, Alexander uh, um, being christened? That's Luke's grandfather. He took on the nickname of Hinch. It clearly was in the family, Uncle Hinch, and then he became Hinch. Named at that time, um, he would have been Viscount Hinchingbrook. So Alberta and George's son on the death of Uncle Hinch became Viscount Hinchingbrook. So when I refer to Hinch, it's Hinch. Hinch has gone back to school looking very fit and uh, very fit and splendid. Drogo, which was their second son who died as a, uh, 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 during a test, as a test pilot during the Second World War, but he's young here. That was their second son was Drogo. That is a Montague family name. Has gone with Mr. Greg, his tutor, to Runton for three weeks. And Faith and Betty, those were her two younger children, she had four children like me, are with Francie. Francie was Alberta's uh, half-sister because remember her mother remarried. We've had a quite wonderful weekend at Hinchingbrook. So thrilling, interesting, and so easily run that I'm rested instead of tired. So clearly they had a party while their children were away. We were 20 to breakfast and dinner for three days and 40 to 45 for luncheon and tea. The butler managed it all wonderfully and Mary's perfect meals just enough. Mary obviously was the cook. No luxury, no lavishnessness, that's what she wrote, made all the house party comment on it. The four important heads of the Board of Agriculture, the Minister of Education, the President of the Scotch Board of Agriculture were here, and all the others were heads of some important departments. And she even says, for instance, head of the Cooperative Movement of Women's Institutes, President of the Agriculture Union, etc. And she says that, and then um, she, and then I'm going to go into the uh, American uh, thing. And uh, she says, Sunday, we had a half a dozen of our own, uh, own men, local farmers. And then she said, they all left yesterday. And in the evening, here we go, we had all our American soldiers here. They are a delightful lot of men, so grateful and so homesick. I had coffee and cornbread for them, departing from our strict rations for once. They wandered all over the house, so again, she's at Hinchingbrook, loved the pictures, all the Cromwell connections, but especially talking to us going through the vacant house and kitchens and were to write, were to quote unquote, write home to mother about it. So at this period, they had moved out of the house. It had been re requisitioned for uh, the First World War, and we'll get onto that in other lives. So they weren't, Alberta and George weren't living in the house. They had vacated it um, because it was used for the during the First World War. Uh, and then it says, Harry came down to help and brought loads of cigarettes. Uh, they were here from three to six, thoroughly enjoyed themselves. And then she says, uh, today we go to two villages, tomorrow two more. I then go to dine at the embassy and back the next day for two meetings. And then she says, all love, uh, all love and gratitude, Alberta. Isn't that just tremendous? I mean, absolutely tremendous. Uh, just to hear the connections that Alberta herself as an American was having with uh, the American soldiers. Now, I will get into two things. Uh, we will be going more into Hinchingbrook and the wars when it was uh, both times Alberta was there living in the house when it was requisitioned by the government. And we will be getting into that more as I uncover a lot of the war letters. There are many, many war letters. I, it's, so I need to go through that, but incredible war letters. What I have here is I have uh, some kind person in America sent me, it's incredible, clippings, and I'll just show you the two I'm going to read, 
clippings of, had gone through chroniclingamerica.loc.gov, uh, the Library of Congress, and pulled out every time Alberta Sturgis, the ninth Countess of Sandwich, was in articles. And it is extensive, extensive. So I need to go through all of these and highlight her name. Uh, a lot of it, I need to go through, uh, a lot of it um, is about her engagement. But I pulled out two to read today. So I'm just going to, in one sense, uh, I think that's what I have for everybody today. That's what I wanted to read today. Oh, and I'm going to end with this box and just talk about it because that will be our next session. But I'll just show you again what was pulled for me, which is incredibly kind. Uh, again, somebody sent all of these. I mean, there must be a uh, hundred of these clippings. And these are the two that I'm going to read for you now. Uh, they're really short. And uh, let's see. So this is, it looks like is in the first one I'm going to read is in the Washington Times. And this was March 9th, 1903. So this is before she is married. Read it. And then I'm going, if you don't know what it means, I will explain. Um, but it's really quick. It's one sentence and it says, Mr. and Mrs. Francis Leggett. Now remember, her mother, Betty McLeod, who was married to her biological father, William Sturgis, when William died, uh, he was aged in his 70, maybe 71. Alberta was 17. Her mother then remarried Frank Leggett. So it says, Mr. and Mrs. Frank Leggett of 209 Madison Avenue sailed yesterday for England accompanied by Mrs. Leggett's son and daughter, Hollister Sturgis and Miss Alberta Sturgis. They have rented Lady de Grey's house on Bruton Street, which they will occupy during the London season. And that to me is incredible. So that was 1903. So we know that she did a season in 1903. We know she did and didn't, I, I, from my reading around, I'm not sure Alberta liked it. Remember, we are going to be exploring, um, exploring a lot about Alberta together and her uh, passion uh, towards um, the Vedanta Society and Swami Vivekananda in particular, and perhaps following the path that her aunt followed, which was uh, not necessarily becoming a nun, but never marrying and in, in one sense, marrying uh, God. And she was never able to fulfill that. And I think that's what my dissertation will be around. Uh, she, I believe, sacrificed her own happiness for the happiness, uh, her parents' happiness. Uh, it's unclear and I will be discovering. I don't know yet. There's so much to go through if she did three seasons. My understanding is she potentially did three seasons because she didn't like it. 1902, 1903. She met George Montague in 1904 and she was 28 years old. So much older um, than most people at that time. So that's that. And then the other one, the last one I want to read here, which is pretty incredible, is from, I love it is from the Evening Star, Washington, D.C., uh, February 16th, 1947. So this is four years before she died. And it says, Lady Sandwich, honor guest at musical. Lady Sandwich will be guest of honor at a musical and tea to be given tomorrow afternoon at four o'clock at Georgetown Visitation Convent by the executive committee members of the alumni and the current graduating classes of the junior college and high school have been invited uh, invited to attend. And so then it lists um, who the hostesses were, and then it ends with Lady Sandwich, who is the former Miss Alberta Sturgis, is an alumni of Georgetown Visitation Convent and a classmate of the Mother Superior. She always has welcomed members of the Alumni Association at her home in Hinchingbrook, England. And during the war, her hospitality was extended to all with Georgetown connections, entertaining them 
in the cottage on the estate to which she and Lord Stan Sandwich moved so that Hinchingbrook Castle could be used as a Red Cross convalescent hospital. So again, they would call Hinchingbrook at that time a castle. And during the Second World War, it was requisitioned by the government as a Red Cross convalescent hospital. So, and after that uh, was um, the Second World War finished, and again, this was in 1947, uh, George and Alberta decided to stay on the estate in what was called uh, Hinchingbrook Cottage, which was built by the 8th Earl of Sandwich. They didn't move back into the main house. Their son moved in. That is where uh, my father-in-law then grew up. Their son moved in and then he sold it in 1955. So I wanted to read uh, both of those articles to you. Now I touched on, um, I touched on everybody my, and I don't know, and we're all going to study this together, my idea around Alberta having done possibly three seasons, not necessarily liking it. I need to find some type of letters around that. I think I will find those between her and her aunt, Tontine. Uh, I don't think she would have written that to her mother. Uh, but what I do have in here, and this is my next box, and I will be pulling things and we will go through it together next week. But this is incredible, everybody. Absolutely. It's almost like there's trace paper here. So what we have here, and I'm going to hold this up really carefully, but I'm going to have to read all of these. But the great news is, is Alberta typed them all out. She took the letters between her stepfather and her mother, and typed them out. So may, it's inc absolutely incredible. I'm gonna read page one, it's not very long, you can see here. She typed them out and what these letters are, you can see here, there are uh, inc incredible amounts of them, absolutely incredible amounts. So we do know that there was a period that Alberta wasn't well and she was in her room for some time at Hinchingbrook. Again, I don't know the details around that, but I do know that during that period, she was looking for family history. She was archiving, archiving, archiving family history. You can see here on the very first page, it, it's almost like she's recalling her significant dates. It says, Hollister went to Lawrenceville High School in New Jersey, September 1896, the year I went to Rome. So she's, and so what she went to Rome in 1896, that would have put her at 19 years old. And then she writes at 19, he went to Princeton in 98. They were two years apart. Um, uh, and then it says uh, another one, uh, it says 1901, I went to Ridgely, that was Ridgely Manor in, uh, up in Stone Ridge uh, with mother in August. And then she writes, 1903, I was very ill, and we just read that article, but sailed for Europe in spring. So she even went when she was ill, and father sent Holl they, Hollister, they called him Holly, Holly to me. And then November, mother and I went back to Ridgely and stayed all winter. And then she writes, 1904, they were then at that house in, on Bruton, uh, Lady de Grey's house that they rented from May onwards. This is when she became engaged. Well, after the season, engaged George Montague. And then it says this, mother, you and I went back to Ridgely that autumn, you dreaded walking out with your father. I don't know what that means, but uh, so she has in one sense written her memoirs here. And I can, I can read this uh, about her youth. This is going to give me an incredible, incredible insight into Alberta's uh, youth, incredible insight. She's literally written uh, notes here about growing up, 
what it was like, her memories, like things like the next few years were spent by the family between their New York house and Ridgely. Um, I know I can just read it. It's, it, it um, what she says, and I'm just going to read this one sentence, and then we're going to dive into it next session. Alberta never came, quote unquote, out in America. Her mother was preoccupied with her own life, her husband, and household, and it does not seem to have occurred to her at this time to make any special effort for her eldest daughter. There's so much more here, everybody, that we are going to read. It's... And this, to me, is really the heartache of Alberta and what makes her so different from these American heiresses that we have read about. She, from what I'm reading, she was uninterested. She wanted a different path. She suffered a great loss with the death of her biological father. Um, and yeah. It, was, it is a gift to have all these letters and diaries. So this, everybody, I know everybody's writing, wow, wow. I have just touched the surface. There's so much more I could read to you. So shall we meet again next week? And I will have had time to read all of these. I'll be staying up late tonight and tomorrow. Um, and I will be reading all of these. And then we're going to come together again and look through them so we can really understand Alberta and her childhood, because I think as many of us know, this, your childhood can shape you. And for me, understanding Alberta in her youth is going to help me understand more about what it was like for her when she moved over to England, had to say goodbye to all of her family and start up a home in a foreign country. We may speak the same language, but it is a, it's foreign. And I know for me personally, as an American, you know, when I moved over here, it's a hard transition and to begin with. And um, it is because it's different. It's not your home. And so when people ask me all the time, uh, you know, when I say home, if I, so I get very emotional because, you know, your, your home is where you grew up, and I grew up in America, and that is my home. So thank you all uh, so much for joining. We have had so many of you uh, view. It's incredible how many of you have uh, watched today, so many of you online, and I can't wait to share more with you. What I do want to show you is because I know the last streaming, I'm so happy that the streaming um, stayed good. I am just going to show you just, I think this is worth it for everybody to see here, uh, a photo of Alberta's grandfather, her father, and Alberta. And then we will, uh, we will uh, wrap up until uh, next week. So I can get a little bit closer so everybody can see. So this is Solomon Sturgis, and again, he had that enormous uh, bank. He was, and, and where he made all his money was from grain elevators. Can you believe that? Grain elevators. And during the first, I think, Chicago fire, his grain elevator was the only one that survived. That was his bank, and that was, uh, so you can see, probably not very, if you look hard enough, it's very hard to see, but it does say right there, Solomon Sturgis and Sons. But look at that extraordinary bank in Chicago. Then I want to show you uh, William Sturgis. So this is Alberta's uh, father. So you can see Alberta Sturgis there. And these are photos just that I wasn't able to show uh, last time, but now I can. And then this is a beautiful, um, this is Alberta on her uh, 18th birthday. So 18th birthday. She has auburn hair. And she's absolutely stunning, absolutely stunning. And with that, it's ringing five o'clock here. I'll wait for this one to go off so you all can hear that because I think it's sometimes lovely to hear uh, the bells ringing and we can then uh, wrap it up. They're about to go because I can, I can tell. Here it goes.
And with that said, I will sign off. Thank you so much for joining me. And again, I'm so excited to do this project with you and have you on board. And my plan is to stream live uh, two to three times a week. And I can't wait uh, to explore more with you all. So I'll see you all next week. And here is to a happy and healthy and let's say restful as well, 2023. Night, everybody.